Access um, 2010 that allow you to do things a little bit differently. The whole idea of this is we want to be able to navigate um, through the things in our database. Let me rephrase that. Not necessarily we as in the database developers, but we want to, if we develop a de uh, database in Access and we give it to someone else, we might want to limit what they see and what they can interact with, especially if they're not terribly familiar with Access. We don't necessarily want them getting into the tables directly. We might want uh, them to use our forms and, uh, you know, not access the subforms directly, but go through the main form and, and all that sort of thing. So we might want to limit what they see. So. There's a, there's a couple of different ways that you can do that. Uh, two of the three ways I'm going to demonstrate. Um, the third way, unfortunately, we don't have Access 2010 in here, so I posted a link to it. Um, so let's, let's start, let's take a look at these three methods. We'll spend a little bit of time talking about this. Then we'll get into discussing um, integrating databases with other applications. All right, once we set up the database and um, we have the structure correct, we want an application to sort of sit on top of it. Remember, we talked about the database as being the foundation. We then want applications that can access that data. And we'll talk a little bit uh, of how that is oriented. And then we'll, we'll go, we'll see how we are on time. All right, first of all, the first thing that you can do is you can actually customize this over here to limit what people see and what people don't see. So for example, now um, <laughs> query one, query two, I didn't give terribly descriptive names to, but what you could do is if you gave descriptive names, you could almost use this like a menuing system. You could go in, for example, and hide the table so that they couldn't access the table that, themselves. And you could organize this by object type. So you'd have all your queries, all your forms, all your other stuff. Let's go and make a form, for example, just to show you what I mean. Let's say we have a table, or we have a form for the faculty table. All right. And we could say faculty form. And then again, it's grouped under there. Um, you can go in and actually, um, you could show only forms. So if you only wanted to give them access to forms, you could show only forms. Um, you could go in and somehow here, I thought you could um, rename. But I see that option's disabled. There, you can rename an individual thing, but you can't name the group. All right. But you could you almost use this as a menu system by, by simply setting that up and, and doing that. I'm not saying that's the best thing to do, but you could do it that way. That would be, that would be one option as far as navigation goes. The next uh, um, uh, option is what's called a switchboard. And really, all a switchboard is is a form that has options that get put in its own table where you can control what the user sees and, and runs. Um, in 2007, you access a switchboard by going to database tools and clicking on switchboard manager. It will tell me that there aren't any switchboards. Fair enough. Do I want to create one? Sure. So I'll create one. And it gives me this the switchboard manager where I can actually have several switchboards. And think of a switchboard as being like a menu. All right? Um, you could, for example, have the main switchboard. Then you could have a switchboard for queries. You could have a switchboard for forms, a switchboard for uh, reports. And you could set it up so that you limit what the user sees. In other words, if there's some forms or some queries that you don't want to give them access to, you wouldn't put it on the switchboard. And then you could hide this guy, and uh, they'd be prohibited from, from seeing it. So for example here, this one's the main switchboard. I'm going to click Edit. And 
you can then add a collection of items to the switchboard. And what are items to the switchboard? Things like open up a form. All right. So there you can have a menu option to open up a form. So I'll click new. And the text for the option will be view faculty information. And the command is to open up a form in edit mode. That's what I want to do. What form? I can specify what form, and that'll be the faculty form. All right. So now I have on that one option, and it's, I know it's a little hard to read, but um, that says view faculty information. And if I look at it, what that contains is the header, or the text for it, view faculty information, a description of what the command does. It's going to open up a form in edit mode. And the particular form I'm going to open up is faculty form. So I can click OK. I can close out of here, close out of here. Let's run the switchboard now. And you run the switchboard simply by opening the form. And notice you have a button for view faculty information. I click on it and it opens up the faculty table uh, using that form. Now, it might have been a little hard to see, so I'll go, uh, I'll go into Switchboard Manager again. But if I add a new item, I could add, for example, to add new faculty member. There's actually two options associated with forms. I can open a form in Add mode, or I can open a form in Edit mode. What I did the first time through is I opened it up in edit mode. By edit mode, what that means is it opens it up and it shows me the data that I have. All right? And then I can go make changes or whatever. Add mode opens it up and supplies an empty form so that they can start uh, entering in. So I'll say um, open form in add mode and we can see the difference. Let's name, oh, which form? The faculty form. So now I have two options on the on switchboard, so I can add new faculty, and it takes me to that form, except there's no data in there, and that way I could enter new information in. Um, let's see what else we can do. Let's generate maybe a report or two. Let's go and generate a report from... the student table. And let's generate one from the faculty table for good measure. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create actually a second switchboard. I'm going to create a reports menu because if you have a lot of items, this is going to get cluttered. So you could actually create a separate switchboard for reports. So again, what I can do is I can go into the database tools, Switchboard Manager, and I can click New for New Switchboard, and I can type in Reports. Oops. And on the Reports Switchboard, I can edit that, and I can add items to that report switchboard. So I can click New, and run the faculty report, open report, which report? Faculty. I could add another new item to run the student report. Command, open report, which report? Student. Then I can add an option on the report switchboard that says new back to main switchboard. Go to switchboard, main switchboard. Can close that. I can then go onto the main switchboard and edit it and add an item that says reports menu. Go to switchboard, reports. Now, when I open up the main switchboard, 
I have those two options I had before for the forms, the, to view faculty and add faculty. I also have a reports menu option. When I click on that, it opens up the reports menu and I can run those reports. Or I can click to go back to the main menu. All right. So this is a nifty little tool that allows you without too much pain to create uh, a little navigation that you can go through. Um, this has been in access for quite a while. This, this mode has been in access for quite a while. And it's not a particularly attractive looking interface. But at least the user doesn't have to sift through tons of reports and forms. You can give them labels of something that's easily understandable so that they know exactly what they need to click on to do stuff. The other thing, again, is, is you know, if you have a form with a subform, you don't necessarily want them clicking the subform by itself. So you could limit to what they see on, that, uh, on the switchboard. Now, one last thing. We can do one step a little bit better than that. All right? And that is, we can, let me see if I remember this, go here, database properties, then click cancel because that's the wrong option. You can go here and say access options. I always forget where that is. Down there it says access options. And I can say for this database, current database, when the application opens, run the switchboard form. So that way you don't even have the user, you know, having to pick the switchboard to run it. Right? They can get right into the switchboard. And I can click OK. And I can close the current database. Then the next time I go in, and open that database, it pops up to the switchboard. All right. I could minimize that, the navigation pane. And then when I go into this, that's what the user would see. Now again, someone who knows access, you know, this isn't like a security measure. This is more of a convenience measure, right? Because someone that knows access knows that they can go and expand the navigation pane, uh, pane and go do whatever they want. But if you have uh, people that are not familiar with it and you don't want to confuse them or have it cluttered with all this extra stuff, you can give them these nice little menus using a switchboard um, to, to show them um, what, what it is that they need to do. Again, one of the things, one of the ideas for your project is to have some sort of user-friendly navigation. And the switchboard, I think I said to have a switchboard, um, that's probably a good choice because it's simple. Um, I'm going to show another option in a second that you have, um, or, or I'll talk about it, uh, point to a reference to it. But a switchboard would be a good uh, option. Configuring the navigation pane, I guess, is okay if you, as long as it looks user friendly. Now, lastly, um, let's look. I put out an angel in the uh, week 13 through 15 uh, uh, folder. Um, a couple links about navigation and access. One talks about switchboards in Access 2010. Access 2010, um, the option to create a switchboard isn't in the same place. Uh, it, it, isn't, it isn't available by, by default. So you have to go and you have to add it to your ribbon. So this shows you the instructions of what you need to do to add access to your rib uh, ribbon. All right, it, it talks you through what you need to do. The other link I have is about creating navigation forms uh, using a navigation uh, pane. Um, and there's a little YouTube video that talks about how, how to use it. Again, I, unfortunately, I do not have Access 2010 uh, on this machine, so I can't go and demo this particular thing. But I imagine it would be pretty straightforward. You can play around with it and, and do it. The bottom line is whether it be a switchboard or you want to experiment with this feature, um, you know, make sure your, your application has some uh, good navigation. Um, <laughs> they, they recommend in the other resources, if you're interested in learning how to make uh, build good 
navigation UI, I strongly recommend Chapter 7 of Steve Krug's Don't Make Me Think, A Common Sense Approach to Web Usability. That is a, a really an excellent book. I know we have it in our library. Um, anyone that's at all interested in web development should read that um, because it really talks about uh, making interfaces that don't cause grief for users. You know, one of the, one of the things, uh, for example, is a clear button. Um, I, this is a little bit off track, but I think, I, I know some of you are involved uh, in the web class. I don't know, maybe others of you will take it. But here's a classic example. And maybe I should stop recording at this point because it unfortunately involves our website. If I go search for a class, First of all, I click Schedule Classes, and it defaults to fall term. You know how many times I've been looking to see what my spring schedule is, and running it and looking, wait a minute, I'm not teaching that then. What? Before I realize, hey, it's defaulting to fall term, which is a current term. But most people using this aren't going to be looking for fall classes, right? Fall classes are almost over. People using it are going to be looking to register for spring. So that's the first issue that I have with it. The second issue is, let's put some criteria in. Let's look for marketing classes that are taught by Zellers. I like this too. They allow you to find someone whose name is exactly that, contains that, or begins with that, but they don't allow you to exclude professors with that name. So I, I guess they're taking the optimistic view. Uh, uh, of it. But anyhow, look at this. Notice the two buttons here. Clear criteria and search. All right. They're right next to each other. The clear criteria button is first. The clear criteria button is bigger. How many times I wondered students haven't gone in and entered their information, let's go and do a search. Oh, nothing. Oh, wait a minute, I clicked the clear criteria. All right. If anything, maybe that button could be off to the side. Maybe it could be smaller. Maybe this could be a big old button, <laughs> all right? And so on. There's a lot of things that you could do. That, that book that I, I talked about, the Don't Make Me Think book, really has a good um, coverage of these sorts of issues where, you know, you might say, plain as devil's advocate, well, look, the button's labeled, all right? It's clear that this button clears the criteria and this button does the search. But the point is, is you don't want your users to work that hard. Most of the time, they're not going to go in and clear the criteria. So what they do most of the time, that is search for classes, that should be made real easy. And then the other stuff should be options sort of off to the side. Anyhow, a little bit uh, of a digression there. All right. Any questions about the navigation for your, your database? Yes? Is there any way to prevent the user from looking at Um, the question was, is there any way from using, uh, preventing a user from looking at the design view of a table? Uh, take away their computer. <laughs> I don't believe there is. There used to be um, more um, detailed security in Access. Um, Access used to have different levels of security. Now there's really only one level of security. There is, you can apply a password to a database, and that controls whether you can get into it or can't get into it. You used to be able to sort of assign roles to um, different users, that this user can see design views, this user can see forms but not report. You know, you could define sort of rules about the security. More extensive databases do have that functionality. Uh, access, though, I don't believe there's any way to do it currently. Um, you can make it tough for them by like hiding that on the navigation pane, but if they knew what they were doing, they could probably get into it. I think the thought is, if I can, if I can put myself in the head of the, the designers designing uh, Access, the thought is, is that you're not using Access for some big, major, mission-critical sort of application. You're using it for a small, personal environment where there's a couple people working on it, and therefore, 
uh, worrying too much about password protection and security, allow them into it or not. And, and it's not like larger databases where you might have, you know, uh, uh, enterprise-wise, people accessing it that, that fill all kinds of different roles. And you might want to limit access that way. But um, again, that is, um, is a good question, but uh, I don't believe there's any way you can do that now to absolutely prevent them from doing that. I don't think so. Security is one of the things that really is the diff it really is different between um, access and some of the bigger databases. One of the things that you have to do for your last assignment is the contrast SQL Server and access. Uh, access security um, is pretty much there's a password to get into it and that's it. Whereas with SQL Server you can actually assign different levels of security. People can read this table but not update it. People can read and insert into this table and edit but not delete. So you can apply all different sorts of security. That's kind of, that's kind of called levels of granularity. How finely you can define the security. And access is a very broad level. You're in it or you're not. But in some of the larger enterprise level databases, you have the fine tuning of the security to, to permit them to do different things. So that would be something definitely worth looking into when you're writing up that. That would be one big area to, to compare and contrast. Um, I want to talk about um, integrating databases into applications. And I'm going to focus on web applications, although a lot of what I say is going to relate to um, other applications as well. So, um, you know, so, so don't think I'm talking, m many of these things are, aren't, again, exclusively web things, but I'm going to talk about that because, you know, a lot of applications are web-based and, and it is sort of where um, my, my ba I don't know if you want to say background, but where my emphasis has been lately, so uh, we'll talk about that. All right, a couple things. First of all, I'm going to draw my world-renowned diagram of how a web server and a browser play together. At least I thought I was going to. I don't know, the dot cam isn't working. Yeah. Yeah, that's what my monitor shows too. The dot cam, it just doesn't show it up there. So what am I going to do? I guess we're going to, to use uh, young people's language, we'll kick it old school and actually just write it on the board, I hope. I'll try to write it in, uh, in the green grass here because, here, let's try this. There. In web applications, we have a client, and the client is someone sitting at their computer running a browser. You know, Internet Explorer, Firefox, Opera, Safari, Google Chrome, or it could even be a mobile device running a browser. But the point is, is it's someone that's, quote, surfing the web. All right? They make a request through the Internet for a web page. All right? That request somehow gets routed to the right web server. All right. The web server then sends them back the page. And they, you look at the page. That's a very simplified uh, situation, a very simplified description of what's going on here. All right. Let's define a few things. Anytime in, in, in IT, if you talk about a client, you're talking about a system that's making requests. All right? 
So a client makes requests. A server responds to requests. So if I type in, you know, www.lorainccc.edu, that request gets routed through the internet, hits LC's web server, the web server grabs a page and sends it back through the internet to me. Now, a lot of pages aren't so simple though. A lot of pages are constantly being updated. For example, if I run a Google search, all right, um, sites that, you know, sites that have shown up recently will show up, and if I run it again a week from now, my results are liable to look different as new sites are added. All right, those are called dynamic web pages. In other words, they change over time, and they change not because someone changed the web page, but because they're getting a lot of their stuff from a database. All right, so if this is a simplified view. A more extensive view would look like this. The web server has some scripts that is little programs, and they can be written in a lot of different programming languages. They can be written in, you know, ASP.NET using VB.NET or C Sharp or Java or PHP. But those scripts are there, and those scripts allow the web server to interact with the database server. And the database server, again, is the one that actually accesses the database. I don't know what they're doing to me over in the control room. <laughs> Uh, at any rate, key thing to, to, to remember here, no one accesses the database directly. Everyone that accesses the database goes through the database server. All right? That's one of the reasons why we apply all those constraints to, um, uh, in, in the database, right? Because we make sure that no one can put bad data in the database. All right? Because everyone accessing it, whether it be our web applications or our other applications, go through the web server. I'm sorry, go through the database server. Actually, in this regard, the web server is a client of the database server. So, a lot of times we speak of a machine being a server. You know, oh, that machine over there, that's our server. It's a server in a particular role. And it might actually be a client in another role. So a web server might talk to a database server, and when it does so, the web server is a client of the database server because it's making requests of the database server, and the database server responds. So in a dynamic website like Google, the request is made. The script on the web server asks the database for some information like what is, uh, you know, what, what are the results when I do a search for Lorain County Community College. It pulls from the database a list of sites. It creates an HTML file that gets sent back here. But the idea, again, is, is that there are SQL statements and there's code in the web server scripts to connect to a database server and to make requests of the database server. How does it make requests? It makes requests via SQL statements. Uh, the SQL statements could be and oftentimes are queries. You know, if I'm pulling data out, like doing a search, I'm doing a query on a database. Uh, or it could be, um, it could be um, a case of me adding data. All right. Um, in which case, when I'm adding data, um, the, the request that I'm making is to insert this row via a SQL statement to do an insert. For example, if I register for a site, if I go to you know, Netflix and create an account, I get a form, I type in the form, I click submit, the web server is going to make a request to the database server to say, here's an insert statement, go and make that. The database server will take that, 
try to do the insert and it will either succeed or fail. All right. So the key thing to remember in this case is the web server, and this applies to other applications as well, are clients of the database server. All right. So forget about a web application. If I have a desktop application, it will access the database roughly in the same way. Not directly, but through the DBMS or through the database server. Now, depending on the nature of the application, all right, you may log into the application or you may not. For example, you don't log in to Google. You can, there's personalized Google, and you can have a Google Gmail account, and you can log on to it, but you don't have to log on to use Google. When you connect that way, again, the web server still has to make a connection to the database server. It will use sort of a generic user ID and password, one that doesn't have particularly a lot of authority. All right. Within other applications, when you log on, it might give you the ability to uh, add stuff to certain tables and, and view certain tables or not the other. For instance, all right, now I don't know exactly how Angel set up, but it might be that me, because I'm an instructor, my security is set up to allow me to add assignments to a table where yours, you can't add assignments. Not that you'd want to, maybe you'd want to delete assignments and you can't do that either, all right? So we may have different securities based on the fact that we log on. It could take my user ID and log on to Angel, connect to the database using that user ID and password, and then go and, and apply the appropriate permissions that way. It could. It could be done any number of different ways. Let's look at a couple examples of connecting to a database um, from within an application. I think we looked at a quick example before when we, when we talked about SQL. Let's go into a similar one. Let's look at PHP and see how that will do it. Not particularly useful. Yeah, I know what I'll do. I'll pull up an example I'm using in one of my classes. Actually, I think it's already loaded. Yeah, here we go. Process.php. This has code in it that connects to a database and runs a query to pull certain information all right, from that database. Now, let's look at this code here. First of all, this dollar sign con ODBC connect is actually making a connection to the database. All right, it's using the ODBC setup. ODBC stands for Open Database Connectivity. That's a standard that's used uh, that really allows you uh, easily to connect from a variety of different places to a database. And in fact, if we look in our control panel. We can actually see where I set this up. Under administrative tools, data sources ODBC, I created under system DNS 
My data source name is Northwind. The database I'm connecting to is located here. And I could give other parameters too. If there was a username and password that I wanted this particular application to connect to or this database connection to connect to, I could include that there so it would get the proper security. This being a simple access database doesn't really have any password protection, so all I really give it is the name of the database. But now that I've set up this, any program that I want to can use this ODBC to connect to it. All you need is the proper drivers. For example, we need the access driver on this machine, which wasn't a problem. All right. So now, within my code, that's what this is doing. It's saying make my connection to the database using the connection name of Northwind, which if you remember is what I had. I can test to see if it worked. If it didn't work, it'll give me an error. Otherwise, I can run this select statement to pull up employees where the title is like the title that I pull uh, off the query string. And then I can grab those fields and format them and output them. Let me run this to show you what the output would look like of this particular code. This is actually part of the CISS 232 class where we're doing um, AJAX development. And this particular script returns XML. So it returns a list of employees from that database formatted this way. What is XML? XML stands for Extensible Markup Language. It's a way of representing data and it's especially useful as far as transferring data from uh, clients or, or between machines, between systems, between servers and clients and really the other way as well. So it took the data from the database and outputted it in this XML. What is XML? Well, if you've ever done any web programming, you use in HTML, you use tags to indicate meaning. XML is like that as well, except instead of describing a web page, with XML you can describe any sort of data that you want. All right. In this case, we're describing a list of employees. And this gets pulled from the database. So we could write an application that would search for certain kinds of employees. The database would return the, or the, the web server would return this and then it could be formatted into a web page that could be displayed. All right. The idea here though is I can embed right in my programs information about the database. So I can specify what I want to connect to, what SQL statement I want to run, and so on. Let me do a quick uh, Google. Well, actually, let me pull. Let me pull an example from another class. Uh, except this time it will be an ASP.NET example. one do I want? I think I want this one. And then I also want this one. So, this is stuff that's done in the .NET platform using VB.NET. And if you look, you'll see somewhere down here, same sort of thing. I'm connecting to a data source, an SQL data source, and I'm pulling a connection string from somewhere. And notice I have an insert command that inserts in the faculty. I have a update command 
that updates faculty. All these commands are built into the to my program. And they have little question marks here, and those question marks indicate parameters that are going to get filled in at runtime. We talked about parameterized queries and access, where you can run a report and say, give me everyone from a certain state. And you can key in that state every time you run it. The idea of a parameter is sort of the same thing here, right? I don't want to insert the same person over and over again. I want to, there to be a text box and whatever value I put in the text box used for their first name, whatever value I put in another text box used for their last name, and so on. So what I've done is I've set up the inserts, updates, and deletes sort of as generic with these parameters as placeholders, and they get filled in. All right? So I have a select, an insert, an update. I also have another little string of code here. What I'm doing is I'm testing, I'm trying to delete a faculty person, and I am, if, if I'm not able to delete them, I'm counting how many students they have. All right? Because if they have students assigned to them, that might be the reason why I can't delete them. So I'm outputting a message saying, okay, they have three students. That's why you can't delete them. Again, you know, we, we can't look at this for just a few minutes and become an expert in the programming language. But what I want to give you an appreciation of is the way that the SQL statements that we've learned and, and everything that we learned about databases, how those connect to other applications. All right? First of all, remember, every connection goes through the DBMS, through the database management system. ODBC can be used to connect to a database, and, and that's, you know, that's a pretty flexible way of doing things. And then the communication between the client and the database is done via SQL statements. So the client issues requests for SQL statements to get executed. The database does it, either succeeds or fails. In either case, um, it returns the results um, for this. One thing I do want to mention that is distinct about web applications. Web applications are said to be stateless. What I mean by stateless is this. All right? Stateless um, means that each request is sort of a standalone request. All right? If I develop a desktop application, in other words, something that I install to my computer, and run. I'm going to connect to the database when I open the application and I'll probably stay connected throughout the application. And then when I exit, I'll leave the database. In the case of a web application, every request connects to the database, does its thing, and then disconnects from the database. So there's no persistent connection to the database. Every page connects on its own. Every request is pretty much a standalone request. Now, there's ways to connect requests together, right? Otherwise, we'd have to log on to Angel for every page we wanted to visit, right? Angel knows when we've logged on until we log off that that's who we are. So those requests, there is some state maintained there. But the protocol itself of web pages does not allow for any state. Each request is, is pretty much a standalone request. All right, what we are going to do next week, just as a bit of a preview. All right, um, Thursday of next, uh, first of all, we don't have class this Thursday, all right, uh, due to Thanksgiving. Next week, we have a class Tuesday and we have a class Thursday. Tuesday, we're going to talk about, um, we're going to try to bring the class full circle and talk about two different kinds of databases. In, in, in general broad terms. Oh, dot cam is useless, so I won't go to that. They are OLTP and OLAP. OLTP stands for Online Transaction Processing Databases. OLAP stands for Online Analytical Processing Databases. They're both databases. There are similarities between the two, but they really sort of have different purposes. 
And we'll talk about how they're the same, how they're different, how they feed each other. Sort of in a nutshell, the transaction processing databases are the databases that sort of handle the day-to-day -day functioning of a business. Getting the shipments out on time, scheduling the employees, writing their paychecks, paying the bills, depositing the money, that sort of thing. Just the day-to-day -day operations that, just, that the business has to do to keep alive. The online analytical processing databases are where you get into a concept that's called data mining, all right, which is uh, an important uh, concept. That's where you take this data that an organization has that goes back many, many years, and you look for patterns, you look for trends. You try to get sort of a higher level strategic thinking uh, out of those kinds of databases, you know. For example, you know, in both cases we're taking raw information and transforming it into data. For example, just to give you an idea of, of maybe the difference between the two, you know, transaction processing system might keep track of enrollment, all right, here at LC, just to make sure that we have the classroom scheduled right, right, that we don't have, you know, we don't try to put 150 people in a room that's only seats 20. Uh, and that, you know, we, we make sure that, that the, the, the stuff is allocated correctly and that we have, uh, if one class, you know, if, if one class is full, we might open up a second section of the class, you know, to allow more people to, to enroll. So that's just sort of handling the day-to-day -day things of, of enrollment. As people enroll and register for classes, we need to put them somewhere. We need to have classes for them. We need to have classrooms for those classes. So that kind of thing is just sort of a day-to-day functioning, that's what colleges do. Now, enrollment can be looked at from another perspective though, especially if you look over a longer term, for analytical sort of data, like do we need to expand our campus? Do we need another building? Um, do we need another outreach center? Like we opened one in Wellington, I think there's one in Ridgeville, or there will be, and a couple different ones, all right? That's a different sort of decision, and you need sort of the same data, but sort of different data. Or maybe you look at the same data in a slightly different way. That second scenario I talked about is in the realm of online analytical processing. All right? So transaction processing deals with the, the ordinary garden variety, day after day sort of problems that businesses run into. The analytical processing deals with sort of more long-term, more strategic sort of things. And we'll talk about those two kinds of databases on Tuesday. On Thursday, I want that to be a work day on your project. I want you to bring in. I want you to, you know, collaborate with other people in the class. Show me what you have. And, and get any last-minute questions or issues ironed out. All right? In addition, we will talk about the final exam on that day. So we'll talk about the final that probably won't go the full time. We probably, you know, we'll spend about 20 minutes, a half hour talking about the final. Then the rest of the time and the lab time will be devoted to um, um, finishing up the project. All right, any questions? All right, that's all I have. See you over in the lab.